Fictional stories can by definition never be true in a literal sense. Even if they're based on real-life events, the modifications authors then tend to make, for purposes of plotting and pacing, turn these stories into half-truths at best. However, what most good stories do contain is so-called metaphorical truth, a moral of the story that, while the events of the story were never true in a literal sense, if you act as if they were, you will come out ahead, compared to if you had acted according to the literal truth that the story isn't real. And identifying this concept of metaphorical truth, as I've stated in previous videos, has been one of the major achievements of evolutionary biologist Brett Weinstein. What does coming out ahead mean, though? We all know the intuitive feeling of having learned something valuable for life from a story, but what is it good for specifically? When linking potential metaphorical truths to evolution, usually the obvious answer is beneficial for survival, either individual survival or genetic survival. For example, a heroic sacrifice of a male hero for a female love interest, or of a parent for their children, while not serving the survival of that individual, serves the survival of the genes. When it comes to explaining through an evolutionary lens why certain tropes in myths and other fictions exist, and keep repeating, then this is necessarily the perspective we have to take. Since only those that reproduce survive and pass on their genetic legacy, it's also only the stories and myths of those that reproduce that can stand the test of time. But is that all there is to metaphorical truth, or are there other consistent repeating themes in fiction that go beyond mere survival and reproduction? After all, something that doesn't serve my own survival, or even that of my genes, i.e. none of my offspring or other relatives, might still serve the survival of my tribe as a whole. Childless scientists and inventors like famously Newton and Tesla of course have hugely benefited humanity's development not just as a tribe but as an entire species, and arguably much more so than if they had spent their time on raising a couple of kids, because kids tend to require a lot of investment indeed. Thus, not just somebody's discoveries and inventions, but also somebody's ideas can survive the test of time, even if that person has no direct genetic legacy to leave behind. All it takes is for you to write down those ideas of yours in a book, or record them for later generations via some other medium. Those books could be philosophical and other non-fiction books, of course, or you might instead put your ideas into a story. A man's big head doesn't seem to work too differently from his little head, after all. It still enjoys stimulation and likes to spread its contents, its ideas, far and wide. Because just like the little head, the big head realizes that, as long as its contents are stuck within your mortal shell of a body, they're doomed to die along with you. So the only way for your ideas or your genes to survive is to get them out there. We as human beings rarely ever pursue survival consciously. We pursue an indirect indicator of survival, well-being, i.e. maximizing pleasure while minimizing suffering. We don't eat because we consciously tell ourselves, I want to survive, we eat because we consciously notice, I'm hungry. Which is a form of suffering, indirectly informing us about a lack of nutrition, which then turns into momentary pleasure once we start compensating for that lack. A relief pleasure, rather than something that's inherently pleasurable in and of itself. In fact, the idea of having to continue to eat once you're already sated can quickly turn into a new form of suffering. Thus, while pleasure and suffering may be our primary indicators of whether we're succeeding at pursuing survival, they are also still indirect indicators. And if these indicators are what we actually care about, what are the philosophical lessons we're looking for in the stories we tell ourselves and others? Should they be conducive to life itself? Or should their primary focus be on well-being instead? This may not seem like an issue to you at first, because usually well-being and survival are in alignment with each other. This is for one, because the maximum amount of well-being or pleasure happens to be the one thing that enables life in the first place. But also other things that ensure our survival tend to feel pleasurable in the moment. I've covered this more extensively in my video titled Life is Procrastination of Death. The other reason for the default alliance of well-being and survival is that the bottom end of well-being, i.e. the maximum amount of suffering we can imagine, will usually be related to one of the many possible ways to die. If going through the process of dying is the highest amount of suffering there can be, then irrespective of whether your goal is survival or maximizing well-being, in either case you have every incentive to avoid dying. Thus, metaphorical truths found in myths and other fiction, morals of stories that give us guidelines on how to act in the world, will usually benefit us no matter whether the moral framework of the story asserts well-being as the highest value or life itself. Where it gets interesting, however, is whenever well-being and life or survival find themselves in opposition to each other. This can occur on short-term scales with any type of addiction that is likely to be lethal long-term, smoking, alcohol and other drugs that can be pursued for short-term pleasure but are not conducive to survival. The more serious and more consequential topics where this distinction becomes relevant are of course issues like abortion, where not only both the mother's and the child's life need to be considered, given the dangers of dying in childbirth, but also both the mother's and the child's well-being. Is a child actually better off being born to a mother who doesn't want them, or is it better off not being born at all? 
And finally, the ultimate form of well-being taking precedent over survival is of course whenever somebody decides to prematurely end their own vacation from non-existence. This will of course likely reduce the well-being of their friends and relatives massively, but a person who has literally been pushed so far to the edge doesn't necessarily have enough Fs to give anymore to consider that. All they're thinking about is make the pain stop. Thus, a story about self-termination, like 13 Reasons Why, unless this act is consistently framed as negative by the story, would necessarily have to be considered metaphorically false if you define metaphorical truth in terms of what benefits survival. However, if you define metaphorical truth in terms of what benefits well-being, that same story might be metaphorically true. The reason I think it's important to discuss this distinction is that, while evolutionary mechanisms and psychology are already being discussed both by proponents of a life-centric worldview and one focusing on well-being, the analysis of stories and mythology currently seems to be exclusively occupied by people holding a life-centric worldview. And not only that, but often specifically one informed by their religious views too. The two most notable figures here would of course be Jordan Peterson and Jonathan Pajot. So in this video, I want to go where Peterson and Pajot don't seem to dare to go. I want to look at a couple of movies in which well-being and survival are explicitly in opposition to each other. The ones that I am aware of to give a non-exhaustive list are The Hundred, often black, the Hunger Games, The Truman Show, Yu-Gi-Oh! Season 4, the double feature Avengers Infinity War and Endgame, the Swedish indie science fiction slash dystopian film Aniara, then probably most famously True Detective and Attack on Titan, and of course, last but certainly not least, a former Yugoslav motion picture. Yeah, don't worry, we'll get there. Now, I'm not going to have enough time to talk about all of these, so I'm going to limit these three right here to honorable mentions. Or in some respects, perhaps also dishonorable mentions. Aniara is a movie I've watched recently, I recognized the image because Amazon Prime had been suggesting the movie to me before, but I wouldn't have watched it if it hadn't been for a recommendation by another YouTuber called AntinatalistMD. So yeah, he's an Antinatalist doctor. I've linked to his analysis of the movie in the description down below, so feel free to check that one out in case you want to know more about this particular film. I admit I probably got my expectations up too high for this one, the concept of generation starships had been fascinating me for a while, albeit in a rather morbid way, mainly because of the apparent complete disregard for human psychology and individual well-being that a lot of astrophysicists seem to adopt whenever theorizing about colonizing other star systems this way. And indeed we're going to talk about another series technically featuring a generation ship, or rather a generation space station too. Most fictional depictions of generation ships that I am aware of frame them as exactly the kind of totalitarian nightmare I'd expect them to turn out as. The main benefit I see that can be derived from this, aside from reminding astrophysicists to consider human psychology in their theorizing, is to remind average viewers that totalitarian structures don't require human malevolence in order to be established. Environmental necessity, such as having to deal with the dangers and harsh limitations of space travel, can be completely sufficient to get there. And the other generation ship example I'm going to talk about in a minute does a particularly great job at conveying that, I believe. Aniara, meanwhile, is a movie I've found rather terribly paced. I had a hard time relating to and empathizing with the characters. The protagonist seemed strangely neurotic, the astronomer was a cynical alcoholic, the captain of the ship, the guy having to maintain order aboard this drifting ship, i.e. being in the position of having to establish some totalitarian structures in order to ensure everybody's survival as long as possible, was sometimes framed as more evil than he had to be, in my opinion. In combination with the fact that the captain is basically the only male character in the movie and having in the back of my head that this movie is from Sweden, I couldn't help but notice my wokeness senses tingling. At one point in the movie there was also a random orgy scene featuring explicit nudity, that's something Scandinavian movies are a lot less hesitant with in general though, that didn't really serve the plot aside from leading to the conception of a child, obviously, a child about whom the mother-to-be then later realizes that she's going to give birth to a prisoner on board the spaceship. As Antinatalist MD says in his video, now you only need to make the connection that Earth itself isn't that much different from an oversized spaceship. And right there you have one half of the reason why my channel is named the way it is. The other half of the cosmic prison being our biological shells and their survival instincts. The reason I'm putting Aniara among dishonorable mentions is that I can't actually call it a movie containing all that much metaphorical truth. It doesn't even really have an ending, it just kind of fizzles out, it's hard to extract any overarching message from it. The other two series on this list I can't comment on simply because I haven't watched them yet. I've seen a tiny bit of True Detective but I wasn't aware of any of its themes. Apparently the author explicitly stated that he wrote this show while being under the influence of, among others, David Benatar's Better Never To Have Been. Attack on Titan, meanwhile, was a title I had heard of a couple of times. I'm just not that much into manga or anime in general. 
Yes, I am aware I just put Yu-Gi-Oh! on the title screen of this video, but having been exposed to that series during my childhood is indeed one of the factors that biased me negatively against anime, even though I am aware that's almost definitely not doing the genre justice. I briefly flashed in a screenshot of Nier Automata in another recent video of mine, so you can expect me to talk about that game in particular, but that's definitely going to require a dedicated video. These three works of fiction right here, while I do appreciate that they draw attention to the philosophy from what I've seen from them, in case of True Detective that was mainly me reading some of Rust's quotes, in case of Attack on Titan I saw an analysis of some select scenes, all of that was actually a little bit too much on the nose for my tastes. One of the golden rules of writing that authors keep referring to is show don't tell, and when you have one of your characters explicitly spell out antinatalist philosophy in a dialogue, that's telling, not showing. Of course, you can link this to the events of the story, then you'd be doing show and tell, but explicitly refraining from telling the audience what to think is usually the much more subtle and thus also often the more palatable way. In this sense, I'm with Heinrich Heine, whose portraits some of you might recognize from Crowd and Tease channel. He was a poet from the time leading up to the failed German Revolution of 1848, the so-called pre-March period. Some other poets of that time were very explicit about their political demands, including explicit calls for violence in their poems. Heine, meanwhile, mocked those fellow poets and considered the art of irony superior in conveying political messages. For example, one of his revolutionary poems compares the situation leading up to the 1848 German Revolution to ancient Rome and the assassination of Caesar, implying such a thing could never happen in the German states while effectively calling for precisely that to happen. To add insult to injury, this poem is called Zur Beruhigung, translating to for reassurance or to comfort your mind, as if to give the ruling class of Heine's time a false sense of security. Some might regard this as an intellectual game of five against Willy. I for one consider it an opportunity for artistic genius to unfold itself, even though I'll grant that it's also a much more manipulative way of convincing an audience of something. In contrast, having characters monologue about their philosophical views can easily come off as preachy, navel-gazing or even just info-dumping towards a casual audience. Especially when it just sounds like a character being a mouthpiece preaching the author's personal views, that can quickly make whatever pill they're trying to feed the audience too bitter to swallow, and then they'll just spit it out. Being open and upfront about your convictions may be a sign of standing and strength of character, but unless you're trying to get there by impressing them with your confidence, it's not necessarily the optimal way to convince somebody of your views, especially when they are controversial. And while both True Detective and Aniara, the latter through its odd pacing and lack of a real ending, may just serve to perpetuate the confusion between antinatalism and nihilism in the public eye, Attack on Titan explicitly links antinatalism to forced sterilization and thus to eugenics and fascism too. Thankfully, Wisecrack's analysis video was intellectually honest enough to keep separating the two, but at least the movie excerpts I've seen from the series leave me unconvinced so far whether the show itself is an ad benefit for the philosophy or whether it actually does it more of a disservice. Let's start out with The 100. Some say The 100, some say The 100. The former is shorter, and I've always been using that one, and it's what Wikipedia says is the official name, so I'll stick with it. The core theme of the series is obviously survival, and to my knowledge the creators have acknowledged as much, but I'd go a step beyond that and sum up the theme in the question, survival at what cost? One of the core problems that has been attributed to the plot of the show, the continuous power creep, resulting from an effort to always up the stakes with each season, can be retraced to the goal of testing the characters over and over again in terms of how far they're still willing to go in order to secure the survival of their tribe. Obviously, the sunk cost fallacy is at play here, because the further the series progresses, the more sacrifices have already been made to get thus far, and hence the more willing the remaining characters are going to be in order to save what they've still got, to preserve how far they've come. What's positive about the setting of The Hundred, though, is how it takes this one fundamental problem and shows different groups all trying to handle it in their own various ways. The crew of the Ark, the Grounders, the inhabitants of Mount Weather, the people searching for the City of Light, they all have different answers on how to not only ensure the survival of their own group, but also how to do it in a way that minimizes suffering while doing so. As I've stated in the beginning, most of the time preservation of life and avoidance of suffering are aligned. They only start becoming separated when things really go south. There is a certain nihilistic component to the show too, as most of the various groups fighting for survival indeed seem to be aware that this is all they're doing, tribal warfare. When they discuss among each other the reasons for making a difficult ethical choice, the argument it helps our group survive, that group's name changes over time from Sky Crew to One Crew, etc., is usually good enough. In reality, I often see various groups rationalizing their own tribal survival instincts by justifying them in terms of whatever set of values they hold, their religion, their nation, their culture, customs and traditions. In such a framework, the others don't just need to lose, and potentially die, because they are the others, they need to lose because they supposedly have inferior values or are downright evil. 
It's not like this line of thinking is a complete impossibility in the setting of the 100. There are certain customs among the grounders, certain customs among the R crew, etc. that those groups could be defending. However, one reason why they might not do so, why they might consider even their own values as utilitarian tools rather than deontological values, is if they're still aware of where a given custom originally came from. For example, on the Ark, the space station equivalent of a generation ship, because of the tight limitation of space and constant danger of overpopulation, even every minor criminal offense by an adult is punishable by death. Specifically, being thrown out of the airlock, something these sky people refer to as floating somebody. Once they arrive on Earth, though, and the first criminal offenses occur, while some people call for the person to be executed as they used to, in this case, for lack of an airlock to throw them out of by hanging, the protagonist Clark immediately interferes and states the obvious fact that this is no longer necessary, given that the limitation of space is no longer a thing. And thus, sticking to the custom of punishing every criminal offense by death is no longer adequate. This ability to retrace the origin of a tradition sadly often doesn't seem to exist in real life, especially when customs have existed for several centuries, i.e. much longer than the inhabitants of the Ark were stuck on that space station waiting for Earth to recover from nuclear fallout. If a tradition has been around for several centuries, because of the way semantic memory works, people forget the original context in which they've adopted it. When, for example, have you learned that London is the capital of the UK? You know that's the case, you can verify it with a bunch of sources to show that it's a fact, but you don't remember where you first learned it, do you? Customs and traditions, meanwhile, aren't facts in a literal sense, but they can be metaphorical facts in the sense that they help past generations survive. Thus, they're often treated as facts, as this is the way we've always done things, without anyone having a reason to question why. For example, I had a Muslim teacher at school who claimed the origin of pork being haram in Islam might well just go back to a pestilence affecting pigs in particular around the time Muhammad lived. And so, in order to protect his own tribe, fellow Muslims, he enshrined the ban of pork consumption in religious law. Over time, the environment changed, our ability to treat diseases has improved drastically over the centuries, but the religious law, the metaphorical truth that initially benefited survival, is still around. In the hundred, the only group that seems to have forgotten about the origin of their customs surprisingly quickly, including the origin of their Creole language, are the grounders. In a matter of just a few generations, while the sky people were holding out on the Ark, the Grounders created a whole mythology around their commander, including mystic rituals about passing on this title and having the spirit of past commanders inhabit every new leader of theirs, when the actual first commander was just a scientist named Becker, who invented a microchip that can store somebody's consciousness. In other words, there is a scientific or sci-fi explanation behind all the mysticism. The Grounders were just extremely quick to forget about all of this after civilization had collapsed. Yet, despite all of this mythical superstructure, the core values of the Grounders still seem to revolve around tribal warfare more than anything else. The two most commonly uttered phrases, translated from the Grounder Creole, are probably blood must have blood and your fight is over. Their ideology, their religion, while more abstract than that of most other groups in the show, is still just the same Darwinism the others adhere to. After having dealt with various grounder tribes in Season 1 and the more technologically advanced inhabitants of Mount Weather in Season 2, when the first sky people encounter the City of Light in Season 3, this is where the idea of valuing well-being more highly than anything else really comes up for the first time. People can swallow a microchip, similar to the one the commanders used to pass on their consciousness and memories from one person to the next, in order to become part of a network governed by an artificial intelligence named Ali, designed by and in the image of the scientist and first commander Becker. Once you've swallowed the chip, the artificial intelligence will do anything in its power to prevent you from leaving again. But as long as you don't resist, you will not suffer from anything. This goes beyond the old diatribe of sacrificing freedom for security, because the deal seems much better. Sacrificing freedom for a complete absence of suffering. This kind of reminded me of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, in that, while looking at the society from the outside, you are indeed repulsed by the complete lack of autonomy and self-determination of its members, there is that one poignant question that inevitably comes up for anyone who realizes the value of well-being. And that question is, so what if they're happy? Completely surrendering your autonomy to an AI doesn't make for a good story, though, especially not if that AI happens to also have been the one who caused the nuclear destruction of Earth in the first place. So Clark and Co. find a way to take Ali down. Not before said artificial intelligence finds a way to cause another nuclear fallout, though, this time by causing all remaining nuclear power plants to blow up. Why does Ali do this? Well, because she has been tasked with improving life for everyone, and apparently came to the conclusion that ephalism, that's life spelled backwards, more generally referred to as promortalism, is the best way to get there. She has quite literally answered the infamous red button question in the affirmative. Twice. The fallout she causes by blowing up the power plants, something later referred to as prime fire, 
forces the remaining survivors of humanity to retreat into various bunkers again, to be safe from the radiation for six years or so, and they have about six months to prepare for that grim future. Thus, the old problem of limitations of space and resources resurfaces again, and people need to be selected for who gets to live and who has to die. For instance, the show straight up rubs male disposability in the audience's face, when some male side character who has not been selected to survive asks why a girl named Harper got put on the list of survivors to be, despite her known genetic disorder making her survival unlikely. Clark responds to the hobby eugenicist by stating that they simply need enough breeding age women in the bunker or they'll eventually go extinct. At this point, the costs of survival start making some people question whether survival is such a great thing to begin with, especially given the existence free of suffering that many of them have gotten to know in the City of Light. This group is first and foremost represented by the character named Jasper. In the end, he and a few others choose death and well-being over survival and continued struggle. They have a giant apocalypse party with lots of alcohol and eventually drug themselves to death. In some sense, you could say these former followers of the Artificial Intelligence Alley adopted to Evilist slash pro views, except that they are liberal Evilists, making the choice voluntarily and only for themselves, whereas Alley was the more classical, authoritarian manifestation of this worldview that a typical supervillain needs. In the moment they make this decision, Jasper and his followers are of course framed as sad and weak defeatists compared to the defiant and courageous main characters surrounding Clark and Bellamy. But when you consider how life in the bunker plays out later, under the reign of Octavia, now known as Blood Rainer, when the lack of food turns the society living down there into something based on gladiator combat and cannibalism of the defeated, during a period later referred to as the Dark Year, you look at Jasper and Asilk and might think, actually, that guy played it pretty smart. Tribal warfare continues for three more seasons, progressively more and more of Earth gets destroyed, until the crew is eventually forced to relocate to other planets. The plot of season 6 and 7 is, to put it nicely, a complete and utter mess. Especially the early parts of Season 7 give excessive amounts of screen time to all the characters I cared about the least, and some of them I actively hated. But while Season 7 of The 100 managed to take an even more spectacular no-style for me than Season 8 of Game of Thrones, in contrast to the latter, at the very end, in the final episode, The 100 at least finds some weird way to get up again and dust itself off. The remaining survivors of humanity encounter an alien species that makes itself their arbiter, kind of like the Q in Star Trek The Next Generation. If they pass, humanity will transcend and no longer experience mortal suffering. If they fail, they will be exterminated. Clark actually fails this test, even committing a murder while the test is ongoing, and generally throwing pretty much everyone else of her friends under the bus for the sole purpose of trying to save her foster child Maddie, an effort which is ultimately useless as Maddie delivers herself to the antagonist in order to save her tribe. As a consequence of the medical procedures they perform on her, Maddie pretty much ends up with locked-in syndrome, being alive and conscious but unable to move, speak or do anything. She can't even give consent or refuse it anymore, as Clark and her friends are considering a mercy killing. But then of course Clark refuses to follow through with it because of her maternal instincts for Maddie. So she goes with the old when in doubt decide for life over well-being, which I highly doubt is the most merciful thing to do. With Clark having failed the test, the alien species gets ready to wipe out humanity. However, through various speeches by other characters they do get a last chance, which basically just consists of another standard tribal battle that they manage to stop halfway through. How do they stop it? Via a lame speech from Octavia, of all things. Seriously, her character has effed up more than Daenerys in the final season of Game of Thrones, and yet she always got away with her actions. She would have needed some big sacrifice in order to redeem herself. And by blowing up the opposing Dark Commander, who is dead set on continuing combat, with him gone, the opposing sides can somehow agree on a ceasefire. Yeah, you don't really defeat the bad guy in philosophical terms if he's the representation of violence and warfare, and all you can do to deal with him is blowing him up but I'll return to this issue of philosophical victories later. Anyways, now that they have supposedly proven that they can overcome their violent nature, all the remaining soldiers on the battlefield start dissolving and, as promised by the alien arbiters, transcend. Except for Clark, who has failed the test and is sent back to Earth to live her life alone with the dog. But wait, one of the members of the alien species shows up to inform her about the fate of the others. For one, Clark's decision to not mercy kill Maddie is now validated because only people still alive were able to transcend. And Maddie was, even though only in a vegetative, locked-in state. Second, the alien arbiter states it is indeed possible for humans to return from transcendence, just that so far, nobody has ever chosen to do so. And given how plain old biological life has been treating people in this story so far, why would anyone in their right mind choose to do so? But of course, in order not to end the show on a note of our main character having to live the rest of her life as a hermit, pretty much all the remaining main characters still around in the final season choose to return from Transcendence. And now comes the interesting part. The alien arbiter explicitly states that those people who return from Transcendence can no longer have offspring, 
And once they die, they will not transcend again, their consciousness will simply stop existing just like Clark's. The others, like Maddie, remain in a state of transcendence, which isn't explained in more detail, but it seems to be something beyond biological existence, being part of a collective conscious, and of course unable to suffer. Sounds kind of similar like the City of Light, just somehow better. But well, you can still assume to be subject to the whims of these alien arbiters. And given that they were also willing to wipe out humanity first, are they so different from the artificial intelligence alley after all? Anyways, now at the very end we clearly see two main solutions being presented to the problem of suffering caused by the perpetual struggle for survival. One of them is transcendence, which, given the similarity to the City of Light with the microchips that I've just explained, seems very similar to the transhumanist idea of uploading your consciousness into a cloud server. The other solution is a group of people who have explicitly consented to returning back to biological life, but can't have any further children themselves, and accept that their consciousness is tied to their biological shells and will cease to exist together with them. In all honesty, I'd be hard-pressed to find a more consistent representation of the core values of antinatalism in fictional stories so far. How they're actually going to survive now in this small group back on Earth, how long it will be until either resource scarcity or new tribal divisions potentially cause new conflicts, that of course is left in the open. Just like the question of how they're going to continue to provide for themselves when they reach old age. But still, of all the things this series could have done, it decided to end on a somewhat utopian depiction of an actual antinatalist society. Given how messy the majority of episodes from season 7 were, this went way beyond any hopes I had still had for the series. For the majority of the time watching season 7, I wished it all had ended after season 5, with the discovery of a new planet after the seemingly permanent destruction of Earth. That was clearly the jump the shark moment, or if you will the jump the clock moment, so it probably would have been a more convincing ending. But at the same time, it still would have been a life-affirming ending, and a naive one at that. Given their past behavior, what reason would we have had to assume humans would behave any differently when landing on a new world than returning to Earth from the Ark for the first time? The definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing and expecting different results after all. So why I'd pretty much call the final two seasons literally false, not just in the obvious sense that they are fiction, but also in the sense that most of what's happening there is completely unbelievable, the conclusion all this mess led up to is one I would call metaphorically true. Antinatalism and transhumanism are indeed the two major propositions I am aware of in terms of how to solve the problem of human suffering. Were the authors of the show aware of that? Is that the message they explicitly want to convey? Or is it just the conclusion they implicitly arrived at for themselves, potentially without being able to verbalize it, just having this vague feeling of I'm onto something here? In either case, these are the two propositions the show makes, actual solutions it proposes, rather than just resorting to nihilistic resignation before the insurmountable challenge of eternal Darwinist tribalistic warfare. What I actually like the most about this juxtaposition is that the show doesn't suggest a clear stance on which of the two approaches the writers consider superior, if any. They kind of just place side by side so that the audience can make up their own minds. That's how you distinguish philosophical debate from a propaganda piece. Though I do find it somewhat ironic that the majority of screw-ups Clark has done in the final season can be attributed to her maternal instincts for Maddie. If this was intentional, this would suggest a slight preference for the antinatalist view on the author's part, especially when you tie it back to the very beginning of the series, with the parents of the Ark sending their kids out into the unknown, sending them back down to Earth against their will, without even knowing if Earth is even already habitable again or not. However, blaming Clark for caring too much about Maddie would be self-defeating for antinatalism, because Maddie is not Clark's biological child, but her foster child, with adoption being something that most antinatalists actively support. So to see it backfire on everyone like this is somewhat frustrating. If you want to talk about the dangers of maternal instincts, fair enough, but I'd restrict that mainly to the incentive of creating biological children in the first place. Don't think I'm hating on maternal instincts. I think there are a lot of instances where those can be a wonderful thing, and Clark, being from a family of medical professionals originally, is a prime example of that in the early seasons. This was precisely one of the things that got me engaged in her character, as opposed to all the strong, empowered female warrior types like Octavia, Indra, Echo, Diosa, and what they're all called. Clark was at heart still a caretaker, and became a leader not because she wanted to, but because she had to. Sadly, the final season disgraced both her and Bellamy's character in many ways, while giving several episodes worth of undeserved attention to the warrior women I just listed. Again, this also used to be a way in which the 100 positively stood out for me for the longest time. That the empowerment of its female characters didn't come at the cost of the male characters, like Bellamy, Murphy or Marcus Kane. But given how unceremoniously they dispensed with Bellamy in the last season, I can't help but notice a certain all too familiar taste with this. And speaking of that familiar taste, at the end of the day, indeed I can't help but feel a little bit like one of the woke people who defended Star Wars The Last Jedi. When it comes to the ending of The Hundred, to the very last episode specifically, 
I feel validated because I completely agree ideologically, but the plot and character development in the final two seasons still sucked. This conclusion may be metaphorically true. The two main answers to human suffering, based on the perpetual struggle for survival, are either antinatalism or transhumanism. However, there's no way for any of these events to even remotely seem like they could be literally true, i.e. the plot and many of the characters' actions simply no longer seem believable. And that is a shame, because a lot of people miss out on metaphorical truths whenever they are conveyed only through literal falsehoods. Just like the type of atheist that denies any value to religion whatsoever, including the value of the messages of their stories. Ultimately, much like with the final season of Game of Thrones, it was not the end state itself that was implausible, it was the road of contrivances that led the plot and the characters to that point. You can enjoy the ending without enjoying the way the show got there. And when looking at the ending in isolation, at least in a metaphorical sense, I have to give massive credit to the authors because honestly, they kind of nailed this one. With the 100 being more than sufficiently covered, given that I had to talk about the entire show of 7 seasons, when we now move on to Orphan Black, there's really just a single episode I want to highlight here. In fact, just one particular scene from that episode. Although to briefly discuss the general premise of the show, with the majority of the clones being infertile, there is indeed not much procreation going on. However, this is more than compensated by the two only fertile clones, protagonist Sarah and the Ukrainian clone Helena, being so heavily defined by their maternal roles. Sarah's case is a little inconsistent, since her daughter Kira, if my memory serves me right, was sired by accident, by none other than Dario Naharis. Well, his name is Cal actually, but it's the same actor. The Orphan Black wiki describes him as follows. He is a resourceful individualist who walked away from a lucrative tech career when he saw his work co-opted by military contractors because of its potential weapons applications. Now an outdoors man living comfortably off the grid in a house he built in the woods, his hard-won peace is pulled out from under him when Sarah crashes into his life, bringing her troubles with her. And that is the reason why it's high time for male hormonal birth control to become available, but that's a topic for another video. Sarah herself was actually more of the neglectful type of single mother. In fact, in the first couple of episodes, the fact that she has a daughter isn't even relevant to the plot at all. Only at some point does she suddenly decide she wants her daughter Kira in her life again, trying to get her back from her foster parent Siobhan, who is naturally not too keen on that at first. Starting from there, Sarah turns into more of the classical, in brackets, overprotective mother archetype. In some sense, this is just a character development as she's trying to make up for her past mistakes her daughter suffered from. But while I can of course rationally understand this behavior being acted out by any mother in general, I always had a harder time buying it from Sarah specifically. A, because I find her daughter Kira a particularly annoying kind of child character, and so for me she was only ever a plot device to get the protagonist to do something rather than a character I intrinsically cared about for her own sake. And B, because Sarah didn't give off the impression that she particularly cared about having a daughter at all when we first got to meet her. It really felt a bit like, oh, we need to make our female lead more sympathetic, quick, let's give her a daughter to take care of. And while I acknowledge that it can often be hard to write a female character without this component, I would consider the aforementioned Clark from The Hundred, being set up in a caretaking job and yet simultaneously as a leader, a much better way of adding this softer side. Sarah, meanwhile, a rather egotistical punk and small-time criminal, is the last person who demonstrates any maternal qualities whatsoever, unless Kira gets thrown into a scene. And given the circumstances that led to her existence, Kira often just seems like the unfortunate consequence of one of her many misadventures, one of the few consequences she now actually has to live with. The only other fertile clone, Helena, is who I actually want to focus on here. Now, she is pregnant throughout a considerable part of the later seasons. The circumstances that led to this pregnancy are semi-consensual, I'd say. And no, it's not the obvious thing, no orangutans involved for once, as omnipresent as that trope seems to have become in modern fiction. Instead, her two twins are actually created by in vitro fertilization. And while Helena generally seems to want children and carries her extracted eggs around with her in protective canisters for a while, while already referring to them as my babies, she eventually joins this weird cult where various women are forced to go through in vitro fertilization to carry such clone eggs inseminated by the cult leader. The cult leader is glad to have an actual clone in his community, one of the two fertile ones to boot, and Helena kind of uses this as an opportunity to get herself the inseminated eggs implanted. However, she then also avenges the other women in the community by strapping the cult leader into the same chair and shoving one of the devices into his gas planet, or so it seems. Anyway, she kills him and burns down the farm where the cult has been living, while she gets to leave pregnant with the kids she is indeed intending to have at this point. However, in the penultimate episode, Helena gets captured by the Neolutionists, who are trying to force the immediate at birth of her twins. Basically, with fertile clones being such a rarity in the setting, any child by either of the two clones is a valuable human asset to the many mad scientist types that seem to run rampant in the story. Given how much she herself has already been abused for various scientific and other experiments in the past, it is at this point that Helena drops the following line, addressing her yet unborn children. You deserve better than me, you will not be experiment, I set you free. 
And yes, she does indeed drop the article because Russian and Ukrainian don't have articles. So she attempts to self-terminate so that her unborn children die with her rather than being born into a life of slavery as guinea pigs. The story takes the old trope of the maternal heroic sacrifice that is dying in childbirth and flips it on its head. And yet Helena would still be dying to protect her children to prevent them from suffering. It has all the same gravitas and meaning of that archetypal sacrifice, but with a very different outcome. Can you imagine any other movie scene that might potentially bring a tear to an antenatalist's eye like that? While to this day I have yet to see a movie in which a mother-to-be aborts a child not for her own, but for their own sake, this one comes pretty darn close. In fact, in terms of the overall stakes at play here, this even goes beyond a mere abortion for the child's sake, since abortions normally don't require the sacrifice of the mother's life. It's just that this situation is obviously more contrived compared to how common abortions have become. I really would like to see what type of cognitive dissonance this scene might cause in a pro-life advocate. Admiration for Helena because she's willing to sacrifice her life for her children, as a good mother would do, or condemnation because she's trying to initiate the most late-term abortion one could think of. In the end, of course, Helena doesn't die, though this would have been a pretty epic way for her character to go out. Her friends rush in, Sarah saves her with a blood transfusion, since Helena's attempt at self-termination consisted of slitting her wrists. They help her escape, the babies don't die, and Sarah and Art help her deliver them. Not exactly the kind of deliverance she was contemplating just before. Obviously, during the happy ending following suit, it is implied that, with the external threats gone, Helena's two boys will now be fine. This seems to be the default with such anti-life, pro-well-being statements. Whenever they touch on antinatalism, it's conditional antinatalism. The realization that there are at least some circumstances in which bringing children into this world would be irresponsible and unjustified. However, those circumstances are usually external ones, so the logic that follows is that, once these problems have been solved, having children is fine again. This line of thinking can also be seen in the next example. If you recall the ending of The Hunger Games, you might remember the last scene shows Katniss holding a child in her arms too. The child cries because of having a nightmare, to which Katniss responds by saying there are much worse games to play, implying she's now going to tell her kid about her struggles in the arena. Not realizing, apparently, that she has still placed this child in the arena of evolution, in the same old game of survival of the fittest, and much like the participants of the Hunger Games themselves, the child didn't consent to that. There's just the anchor effect of realizing that the previous state was obviously worse, but that doesn't mean it's now good. But maybe Katniss can't quite relate to that. After all, she herself was able to consent to going to the arena. At least, technically. Obviously, she must have felt her hand was being forced after her little sister had been chosen as a tribute. But still, up to this point, Katniss herself never got picked from the raffle drum, and this would have been her last year of being eligible, so she would have gotten away unscathed otherwise, which gives another level of weight to her sacrifice. In contrast to the supposedly noble figure of Mary, Katniss actually consents to the suffering on her own behalf to ensure her sister's well-being, rather than the other way around, consenting to suffering on someone else's behalf to improve one's own well-being, as parents do. Then, at the end of the first book and movie, when Katniss and Peter find themselves as the only survivors, both from the same district, now being required by the rules to attempt to kill each other so that there'll be only one winner, they also consider self-termination as a last act of defiance against the rigged rules of this violent game. And the showrunner seems to be convinced they would have been willing to follow through with it, otherwise he wouldn't have stopped the game at this point in order to declare them both the winners, as an exception a decision which will end up leading to his own execution shortly afterwards. The second time though, when the quarter quell takes place and the rules assert that the candidates are to be picked from past winners of the games, the ones who previously thought they'd be safe and financially settled for life, Katniss gets picked against her will for real this time. Being the only female winner of a district, it's clear she'll have to go back to the arena. From among the only two male winners of a district, the older one, Hamish, is actually the one that gets picked, but then Peter volunteers, just like Katniss did the first time. In some sense, you might connect this to the question posed by Schopenhauer whether anyone looking back at their own lives and being intellectually honest with themselves would actually want to go through all of those struggles again if given the choice. Peter is given the choice here, Katniss isn't. So in contrast to the first time when she was the one who volunteered, you'd think now she'd know what it feels like to be forced into the struggle for survival entirely against her will and without any control over it on her part. The book actually does a really good job at describing her mental breakdown when the rules for the quarter quill are announced and she realizes that she will inevitably go back to the arena as the only female victor from her district to date. But apparently the memory of this experience doesn't translate to her making the inference that she's doing the same thing to her children just by having them. Even though those two children will never get sent to the institution of the Hunger Games anymore, the game itself, the struggle for resources and survival is still ongoing. She just removed the walls of the arena, but they're still in the arena. And the absence of walls just prevents them from realizing that. Because beyond the actual walls of the arena, there is nothing there. 
And yes, I do indeed have a song called Arena coming up. I'll link to it here once that video is done, since that seems to be a quite common metaphor within our communities. Moving on to the next one, The Truman Show, also known as the movie everyone forgets about because The Matrix keeps getting all the credit. Kind of like people keep going on and on about 1984 and forgetting that Brave New World might actually be a much more sustainable method of controlling the population, namely more so via their pleasures than via fear. But fear is indeed a central component to the plot of The Truman Show, of both the movie and the eponymous TV event that exists within the movie itself. The showrunners of the TV show taking place in the movie, a 24-7 transmission of Truman Burbanks' life that has been ongoing since his birth and that he himself is unaware of, deliberately implanted a phobia of the sea in Truman's mind. By faking the death of his father as a result of going overboard during a boat trip when Truman still was a child. They do so because the entire show is taking place in a massive dome, large enough to be seen from space, a dome in which the showrunners can control next to everything, including the weather. So they must prevent Truman from ever attempting to leave, so that he doesn't discover the outer borders of this dome. And in order to prevent him from just accidentally running up against one of the walls of the sphere, they place the main set of the show on an island in the center of the dome, with the movie set thus being entirely surrounded by water, there's a natural border that prevents Truman from ever discovering the truth by accident. And in case he would ever consider wanting to find out what lies beyond the ocean, now they've placed a second natural border of fear within his own brain. The premise becomes even more insidious when his wife is starting to pressure him to have a child. That child would be born into the already ongoing TV show, just like Truman himself, and would be just as unaware of it. This would allow the show to continue for at least another generation. But Truman evades her advances, because one weakness in the plan of the showrunners is that his marriage was of course technically an arranged one. Nobody directly forced Truman to marry this particular woman of course, because the showrunners want to have him acting naturally while they themselves are only faking everything around him. But they did do everything they could to nudge him into this direction, as you would probably call it in modern marketing. Among others, they had to remove a different woman named Sylvia, the one who Truman was actually inherently interested in, from the show somehow. Because she was posing a danger to the continuation of the show, as she started considering telling Truman the truth about what had actually been going on since his birth. Now she's trying to somehow help him from outside the dome, but of course her influence on what's going on in there is very limited. The only way for Truman to eventually discover the truth is by himself, through overcoming his fear of the sea and venturing out into the unknown to the literal edge of this miniature world. The showrunners use the weather control system of the dome to summon a storm while Truman is out at sea, fully accepting the risk of drowning him in the process. But he perseveres and even mocks them as the storm is going on, asking them if this is the best they've got. I'm not quite sure how certain he is at this point that he's been part of a TV show all along. He might just have a vague feeling that something is actively influencing every single step of his life. If the latter is the case, you can almost see this as a mockery of God or fate, since that's what the showrunner effectively is for Truman as long as he's at his mercy. When Truman finally reaches the edge of the world, stepping off his boat and onto a staircase at the outer border of the dome, conveniently it has been painted blue so that it's harder to spot against the background looking like the sky, the showrunner admits the truth and basically leaves it for Truman to decide whether he wants to voluntarily continue taking part in the show. He makes one last attempt at nudging him to stay within the fake world by telling him that it's much safer in there while the outside world were cruel and harsh. But Truman chooses the uncertainty and freedom of potentially cruel reality over the comfortable illusion of safety. In other words, he chooses freedom over security. Even though he's probably indeed ill-equipped to face many of the challenges of the real world where he is no longer the focus of attention 24-7. Within the show, at least he had a god looking after him and keeping him out of harm's way in many regards, since this god, the showrunner, had a vested self-interest in keeping him alive and the show running. Outside in the real world, meanwhile, there is no such figure looking after him specifically. There he will just be a face in the crowd, and the real world will be largely indifferent to him as an individual. So in abandoning the god that is the showrunner, now he will have to deal with the inherent nihilism of reality. The life-affirming interpretation of this would indeed be to not overvalue safety, but to instead pursue self-determination even when it comes at the price of inviting more suffering into your life. This is textbook Jordan Peterson stuff, leaving the comfort and safety of your own home, the place you know and where you feel safe, to go out into the unknown, to confront the dragon of chaos, the dragon in this case being Truman's phobia of the sea, to pursue harsh truths over comforting lies, and to then take up responsibility for your own life rather than having the father, the showrunner or god of this microcosmos continue taking care of you. But there is another angle to this movie which I don't actually consider to be in opposition to this first interpretation, but more of an addendum. It's about giving up the illusion that the world you currently inhabit were a safe place and confronting the fear of death, with death being the realm on the outside, that everybody keeps warning you about. 
At the end of the movie, when he leaves the dome, the person Truman Burbank will go on to live a normal life in the real world. But the star of the TV show, the character of Truman he had been involuntarily playing all those years, effectively dies at this point. The show is over, the live transmission of his life stops, there will be no more episodes, Truman has literally exited the world. Even though the god of his little universe himself warned him against it, telling him everything about how terrible things supposedly are on the other side of the wall of the dome. At the same time, the showrunner tried to frame the fake world Truman had been living in thus far as a safe place. Which is a particularly ironic thing to say for a showrunner who has just tried a few minutes ago to make Truman's boat capsize in a sea storm that he, the showrunner, actively caused, and that might easily have led to Truman's actual death. Thus, if the fake world of Sea Haven represents life, a life under the supervision of a god in form of the showrunner, and the world outside represents exiting from this life, which everyone within this fake world is framing as supposedly so dangerous and terrible, and on top of that, the main thing preventing you from exiting this only seemingly safe world is your own fear, then when Truman does exit the world at the end, when he exits the life he has been living thus far, indeed since the very day he was born, then that is essentially the self-termination of this TV show character. Both self-termination and self-determination, exiting life, ceasing to exist in a fake world of only simulated safety, as an expression of the ultimate form of freedom. I hope you can see how these two interpretations are not necessarily mutually exclusive. And from that highly individualist message to a slightly more collectivist one, and by that I mean take a shot every time somebody waxes poetic about friendship, it's time to discover misanthropic talking points that were injected into a children's card game. With Yu-Gi-Oh! I'm of course specifically referring to Season 4, Waking the Dragons, where the villains are the cult of the Orichalcos, with their leader being the former head of the lost city of Atlantis, a guy named Darts. Now, Darts is indeed dead set on wiping out humanity, at least in its current form, by collecting human souls. By beating people at a children's card game, obviously, how else would you do it? And feeding them to a creature known as the Great Leviathan, which is something in between a dragon and a massively oversized whale. And once this mythical beast awakens, it will devour the rest of humanity too. However, he doesn't plan to leave behind Earth devoid of life. He wants to rebuild society in a better form afterwards, specifically rebuilding Atlantis to help it back to its former glory, after humanity has overcome its own evil. In that sense, especially given the choice of a sea creature, you could really see this primarily as an adaptation of the biblical story of the Flood, with the Leviathan itself of course also being a biblical creature just from a later point in time, that is, the Day of Judgment. The series even featured a character named Noah at one point, who was indeed also using an Ark, however that part has nothing to do with this particular story arc. Anyway, when it comes to the supposed evils of humanity, these green stones of the Orichalcos are framed as the main thing bringing that evil to the surface. The seal of Orichalcos is the thing that can show you the evil in every person's heart, including that of the protagonist. If we want to go full Jordan Peterson on the premises of Yu-Gi-Oh in general, obviously the split personality of the main character between the harmless nerdy teenager Yugi Muto and the darker, wiser pharaoh Atem, who is, however, also much more capable of cruelty, given his past as an Egyptian ruler, can be understood as another depiction of the necessity to integrate your shadow. As if the word shadow weren't already showing up frequently enough in this story. Usually we only get to see one side of this, with Yugi being too weak to handle anything threatening on his own unless the pharaoh steps in and helps him out. But in season 4, when their souls are actually separated at one point, you finally get to see the opposite danger too, with the pharaoh quite literally going completely off the rails and pointlessly torturing a minor antagonist after he has already defeated him, just to revel in vengeance and vent his frustration over having lost his companion. In other words, if the shadow is not integrated, it can take you over completely. And in fact, that is the reason the souls of the two main characters were separated in the first place. Because the dark side, the pharaoh, took over and thus could be tempted into using the seal of Orichalcos himself. You know, the very same soul-stealing tool that the bad guys are using. In that sense, Yugi failed to confront the malevolence within himself. He tried to, but he wasn't strong enough to hold the pharaoh back, and thus he himself ended up paying the consequences for his failure by having his own soul taken rather than that of the pharaoh. And this entire section is orchestrated by a character who is arguably much more interesting than the main villain Darts himself. Raphael, a guy who was abandoned on a lonely island by his family after they all got shipwrecked, while this experience is what has led him to losing his faith in the goodness of humanity and thus to adopting his master's misanthropic views, he still holds life itself in high regard, all the way up to the point of making altruistic sacrifices for this purpose. Within the game, this is expressed by Raphael's apparent obsession to keep his graveyard, that is the discard pile where monsters defeated in battle go, completely empty. And in their second duel, he eventually even ends up giving up all his own life points just to revive all the monsters from his graveyard before the game ends, as a natural result of him giving up all his life points and thereby losing. 
which seems somewhat pointless because as soon as somebody loses a game, usually all their monsters get destroyed again anyway. Like, normally you see all monsters on the loser side of the field shatter into a thousand pieces when they lose, including those monsters that weren't directly destroyed as a result of the final attack. Of course, normally in the context of the story, all those monsters are just holographic projections anyway, but the series sets it up in such a way that if the seal of Orichalcos is in play, then somehow the monsters do indeed become real and sentient beings? Well, if that is the case, Raphael's sacrifice only brought them back from the graveyard for a couple of seconds. But I guess for him it's the effort and the symbolism that count more so than the actual consequences. He really seems to be more of a virtue ethicist. At the same time, Raphael is indeed the one probing the protagonist to confront the malevolence within himself. He sets up his place in such a way that the seal of Orichalcos ends up in Yugi's hand, so that he, or rather his dark side, the pharaoh, can be tempted into playing it for a chance at a quick power grab to turn the tides of the game around, but doing so at the expense of others. This is how Raphael tries to confirm his own misanthropic worldview by practically demonstrating to the pharaoh his own potential for evil. In particular, by pointing to the fact that the pharaoh is sacrificing his monsters in an attempt to win, whereas Raphael is doing the exact opposite. He rather sacrifices his own life points and loses than having any of his monsters stay in the graveyard. Now, of course, sacrificing monsters has been a perfectly normal part of the game dual monsters throughout the entire series, but with the caveat that normally those monsters are indeed just holograms, not sentient beings, which they become once somebody plays the seal of Orichalcos. And that all of a sudden makes the ethics of sacrificing individual monsters for the supposed greater good of ultimate victory much more debatable. Ah, screw it, I'm just going to say it, Raphael is basically a vegan dualist. In that case, I just hope all that leather he's wearing is synthetic. With that analogy in mind, Season 4 of Yu-Gi-Oh! does indeed show the connections between misanthropic arguments for human extinction, the way we treat other sentient beings, and the question of whether this is indicative of any inherent evil within humanity, or just something that emerges as a consequence of our environment. That's the role these green Orichalcos stones play. Do they just bring an already existing evil within humans to the forefront, or are they, i.e. a property of the environment, that which incentivizes humans to commit evil acts in the first place? Of course, our main characters push back against all of these notions. With the core theme of the series obviously still being that of friendship, the good guys can't really take any other position here than a philanthropic one. So anyone who thinks that the misanthropic arguments that Darts and Raphael are bringing up indeed have a point, will probably be tired of being framed as the villains again just for speaking some uncomfortable truths. At the same time, this tells us something about the effectiveness, or lack thereof, of misanthropy in general. While I think it's perfectly fine to make misanthropic arguments in a philosophical sense of merely acknowledging that human actions do indeed cause a lot of damage, linking this behavior to some supposed inherent flaw of our human nature, rather than just our animal nature, that I think would be to arbitrarily assign a level of significance to human actions that runs counter to our knowledge of evolution. For the most part, when humans are doing evil or cruel things, they do so because they act in accordance with their animal nature. Humans are cruel because animals in general evolved to have the ability to be cruel. And this ability in turn evolved from the necessity for struggle and competition with others. And that in turn evolved from scarcity of resources and territory in our natural environments. Sentient beings are cruel because nature itself is cruel, because they have needs they are compelled to fulfill, since they suffer if they don't. This may not justify or excuse the damage their own actions then do as a result, but it perfectly explains where it comes from. Even every criminal starts out as an innocent child forced into existence without its consent. Every perpetrator, if you just go back far enough in the history, starts out as a victim. You can really only disrupt this continuous causal chain by inserting some ill-defined concept of specifically human autonomy into it at an arbitrary point in time, where the person suddenly becomes solely responsible for their choices. In other words, you need to rely on the assumption of free will in order to reasonably be able to call human beings evil in any way. And since I no longer have any reason to believe in free will, the misanthropic arguments for human extinction, as put forth by Darts and Raphael, at least in their isolated form, fall flat for me. Rather, I see the misanthropic arguments as nested within philanthropic arguments. If humans do evil things to others in order to somehow reduce their own suffering, while you can of course call that selfish, that means the root cause of the problem is not human evil, it's indeed the fundamental problem of suffering. So considering that, let's move over from this villain making misanthropic arguments for human extinction to somebody actually championing some of the philanthropic arguments. Obviously we cannot talk about well-being superseding survival without talking about Thanos. And he is pretty much the only reason why I'd even bring up Avengers Infinity War and Endgame in this context. I'm ready to take a lot of heat here, but I don't actually consider these two great movies. I was already skeptical when I saw the initial adverts for Infinity War, because it simply looked like an excuse to cram as many different superheroes as possible into one movie, and then of course the laws of power creep would dictate a worthy opponent for such an army. And we certainly got one with Thanos. The problem is that his character was pretty much the only one that got enough space to breathe in these movies, since all the heroes had to share the spotlight with each other, leaving hardly any opportunity to advance their individual character development. Instead, we got the thing we always get with modern movies, 
constant rapid overstimulation of visual effects, because if there's one way to justify CGI wanking, it's superheroes toying around with their powers. What big studios still don't seem to have realized is that this type of short-term dopamine hit-like stimulation can get dull extremely quickly. My brother actually managed to fall asleep while watching Infinity War. Granted, that may have been because he watched it on a plane, but still, you would think this constant visual effect stimulation would do its best to keep your attention, but the opposite can easily become the case. The main plot structure of Infinity War also wasn't remotely interesting to me, since from the setup of the premise, having to gather the stones to assemble the Infinity Gauntlet, it was clear to me that we were not only headed for a standard video game like MacGuffin Fetch Quest, but also that of course Thanos would inevitably, pun intended, end up with all stones at the end because obviously you want the antagonist at the peak of his power for the final confrontation. A MacGuffin can generally be defined as an item that matters supremely to the characters within a story, but not to the audience themselves. The One Ring, the Philosopher's Stone, Excalibur, the Tesseract, you name it. Everyone within the story keeps obsessing about this inanimate thing, but since it's of course an entirely fictional item, it has no direct counterpart in reality that the viewer could get invested in. Unless the MacGuffin is indeed a character, like r 2 in Star Wars, being the keeper of the plans for the Death Star, a character you can come to care about, an inanimate object is not inherently interesting. The only interesting part about the Infinity Stones is of course how Thanos gets them, which steps he has to take and which personal sacrifices he has to make to get there. And that's the reason why I only recall for one of the stones how he obtained it, the one for which he had to throw Gamora off the cliff. So while I will easily agree with anyone asserting that Thanos is the best part about these two movies, that's still not saying too much. As glad as I am to see the general logic of negative utilitarianism being given such a massive display, exposing a huge number of people to at least the idea of the avoidance of suffering potentially being of higher value than the preservation of lives, if the representation of this position is done badly, it can do more harm than good to anyone hoping for these types of philosophies to be taken seriously for once. Thanos is ultimately still a strawman of all these anti-life pro-well-being views. And while some may immediately want to disagree and say that Thanos actually wants to preserve life overall, just for fewer sentient beings, his proclaimed goal is obviously still to reduce suffering. Given that overarching goal, his position is still so inconsistent that it almost looks like his philosophical stance was deliberately weakened in order to make it easier to attack. Not because of some conspiracy or bias against negative utilitarianism among the writers per se, rather it was probably just done in order to give the heroes a remnant of a chance of defeating him. Because if he had been an actual ethelist, one with a much more graceful method of exterminating all sentient life than the aforementioned artificial intelligence Ali going for the good old red button, then it would have been much harder to make a rational case against him. The only way I see how to do that is to defend freedom, consent and the right to self-determination as deontological values, but a consequentialist negative utilitarian like Thanos could easily argue against that, stating that our very desire for freedom and self-determination is indeed just that, another desire, a result of our physical bodies, and as such the need for freedom and self-determination will cease to exist, along with any other needs, once we cease to exist. Thanos' actual stance in the movie, with him only wanting to wipe out half of all sentient life in the universe, and with him believing he would only have to do that once and then he could retire, falls apart after about two seconds of consideration. First, he obviously doesn't think about how to distinguish between those that should and should not continue to exist. He splits families and couples in half by eliminating some of their members but not others, thereby causing immense suffering all over the universe that wouldn't have been there otherwise. Worse, he's causing the suffering among the people who survive, i.e. the ones he ultimately wants to protect by giving them access to more resources. Second, a lot of places even just within our own world, Earth, still have birth rates above replacement level. And you can assume this to be the case on other planets in the Marvel Universe harboring similar civilizations as our own. If so, how long would it take until the population size recovers to its former levels? Would Thanos then be willing to snip again? Finally, the question remains, is the Infinity Gauntlet indeed not capable of wiping out more than half of all sentient life? Or does it simply not do that because only wiping out half of all sentient life is what Thanos happens to want? If his goal is to minimize suffering, and he's already willing to sacrifice countless lives for that, albeit in what seems to be a rather painless manner, with people just quietly dissolving to dust, why not go all the way? Then he could retire indeed, as he claims to be hoping to do once his grave but necessary task has been completed. Despite all of these logical inconsistencies in Thanos' position, despite all the weaknesses that have been put into his ideology, despite him just being a straw man of a much darker but also much more consistent position, the heroes still fail to defeat him, not just in Infinity War but also in Endgame. 
at least in a philosophical sense. They never actually debunk his position, even though it's so easy, as I've hopefully just demonstrated. They just defeat him physically by overpowering him. But not only do they not disprove his reasoning, they actually just do unto him what he previously did unto them. Tony Stark picks up the gauntlet, snips, and now it's Thanos and his troops who dissolve into non-existence rather than vice versa. The only gravitas this moment has is that Tony Stark completes his character arc from self-centered playboy to making an altruistic sacrifice. This is the type of character arc that Harrison Ford supposedly wanted for Han Solo originally. And when they missed that opportunity in Return of the Jedi, apparently someone thought it was a good idea to rectify the submission at the next possible opportunity in The Force Awakens. We all know how that ended, it made things far worse. So while I'm glad that Iron Man got to go out in a much more charitable way and with the natural conclusion of his character arc, there is still a nihilistic element to this supposedly inspiring superhero movie. There is no philosophical victory of the heroes over the villain. They just beat him with his own methods, which means they stoop to the same level as him. They don't have any alternative solutions to offer, and it might well be because there are none. It might well be because the villain's analysis of the nature of the world has at least some truth to it. And had Thanos actually had a second gauntlet, debunking his logic would have been even harder, if not impossible. He truly would have been inevitable. But now that I've criticized this about Avengers Infinity War and Endgame, it would be hypocritical of me to make the same mistake and only point out the problem without pointing to any suggested solutions myself. Fortunately, I don't need to come up with them, they already exist in past works of fiction, and some of them we've already touched on today. But there is probably no better place to start explaining what I mean by a philosophical victory than with the just mentioned Return of the Jedi. The Emperor makes Luke a clear philosophical proposition, to take his father's place at his side and rule the galaxy. A proposition of sacrificing the life of another, even a family member, in pursuit of power. Luke, as we know, doesn't fall for that temptation, but he also doesn't simply overpower the Emperor. In fact, he doesn't defeat the Emperor at all. Darth Vader does, getting fatally injured in the process, thus completing his redemption arc on the one hand, just like Iron Man has a redemption arc from egomaniac to altruist, but simultaneously also defeating the Emperor on a philosophical level. Luke's trust in his ability to redeem even somebody like Darth Vader, and Anakin's ultimately still remaining love for his son, demonstrated a better way forward, and the superiority of this philosophy is confirmed by the tangible consequences of the Emperor indeed losing because of his philosophical failure. His worldview was metaphorically wrong, and Luke and Anakin proved it wrong, and all proved their own philosophy metaphorically true. There is a similar scene in the fifth Harry Potter movie, where Harry is at first tempted towards the dark side when he casts a torture curse on Bellatrix Lestrange for having killed Sirius Black. Much like the dark side tempting the Jedi, Voldemort and the Death Eaters keep incentivizing Harry to act on anger and hate. And it works at first, but when Harry realizes this, he actually gets into a state where, even though he's lying on the ground, physically defeated, he's still overcome Voldemort philosophically, because he can't even feel hate towards him, the guy who killed his parents, any longer. Instead, he says he can only feel sorry for him. And finally, in terms of examples previously discussed in this video, Katniss and Peter being willing to rather self-terminate than keep playing according to the brutal survival rules of the Hunger Games is indeed a big middle finger to that game, and because the showrunner is forced to give in to this threat, it's not just a philosophical or moral victory, but indeed also one that simultaneously aligns with a real-world victory, just like with Luke and Darth Vader. And in the Truman Show, the victory is not merely in Truman's escape from the physical prison of the fake TV world he's been trapped in all his life, but also he's escaping from the emotional prison of his own fear, the fear the showrunners deliberately implanted in his mind by faking his father's death. Now he's afraid of neither, the water separating the fake world from the real world, nor is he afraid of the real world itself. And of course, in physically leaving the set, he defeats the showrunner in a practical sense too, by completely ruining any chance of his show continuing any longer. In short, as you can see, it's not that hard to give your characters a philosophical victory over the antagonist alongside with a real-world tangible victory. So to mess this up, especially as a professional writer, must either take deliberate intention, an astonishing amount of ignorance and incompetence, or indeed just a lack of ideas for what might constitute sound philosophical principles. David Stewart has stated this specifically about The Last Jedi, that he doesn't think current Hollywood authors seek to actively promote nihilism, because it's hard to promote a moral framework that is in itself the absence of a moral framework. But rather, if somebody is a nihilist, or a moral relativist to such an extreme extent, that they can never feel sufficiently confident in making a metaphorical suggestion on how to act in any particular direction, then that person will be incapable of writing a story that contains a moral message, simply because they genuinely don't know what to say on the matter. And while many might agree by now that all hope is lost in terms of looking for metaphorical truths within the Disney Star Wars trilogy, how could you expect people to have a consistent philosophical message if they can't even agree on how to plan the basic plot structure itself, I was kind of surprised, if not even shocked, to see some of these flaws, albeit to a much smaller extent, in a film as highly anticipated and praised as Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. 
specifically the lack of any philosophical victory of the heroes over the antagonist. Even when I just quickly google what overarching themes people attribute to Infinity War, like the repeating theme of self-sacrifice, again, this is not a distinction between the heroes and the villain. Both the heroes and the villain make sacrifices in pursuit of their goals, and in fact, as outlined earlier, the villain's sacrifice is the one I still remember the most. This doesn't tell me anything about what supposedly exalts the heroes over the villain, if there is any such thing to begin with. Meanwhile, one could argue that even the last film I'm going to discuss today still has at least somewhat of a philosophical victory of the main characters over the villain at the end. Which, considering which movie I'm about to bring up, is quite a pathetic display for Avengers Endgame. So without further ado, it's time to finally talk about the infamous Sirsky film. The story of a retired adult film actor named Milos, who agrees to do one last film in order to provide for the family he now has. Except he isn't told anything about the script, the whole thing is sold to him as a kind of indie improvisation film that is supposed to capture his natural reactions to everything the mad director of the movie has planned. Soon he discovers that this pawn he's supposedly shooting is actually a snuff film produced for a small set of wealthy elite customers who are willing to pay a lot of money to see their perverse fetishes acted out on camera. He tries to get out of the production, but is drugged and forced to keep participating in the atrocities. Then the movie pulls a memento and has him wake up three days later, trying to retrace all the things he has done while under the influence of the drugs. He rediscovers the videotapes recorded during the time, and then it only gets worse and worse from there. The premise of the movie, according to the director Serjan Spasojevic, is that in Serbia you're F from birth and it doesn't even stop after you're dead. I for one don't see any particular reason to restrict this to Serbia, maybe he just wanted to piss off patriots and nationalists in his own country, but in terms of objective measurements of pleasure and suffering, Serbia was 64th in the World Happiness Report as of 2020, behind Peru and ahead of Bolivia. It's not great, but still fairly close to the top third of happiest countries around the world, considering that the report only investigates 153 out of over 190 countries. Anyway, the premise is you're effed from birth and it doesn't even stop after you're dead. And let's say the movie has a very literal approach to depicting that premise, which is the main source of controversy about this movie, not the message itself. That part usually goes completely over people's heads. It's just the depiction. <laughs> Meanwhile, I for one, an antinatalist after all, and thus a natural cynic I guess, can't help but identify the scene as a classical example of juxtaposition of two concepts by putting them side by side. In this case, the common theme connecting the two parts would be, hey look here, two ways in which human consent can be violated all at once. And that was the sound of any remaining parents potentially still watching at this point, disliking and potentially flagging my video. Did I just compare responsible and loving parents to people who orangutan infants? No, I'm not, calm down. I just want to make you aware of the obvious double standard we have when it comes to the term consent. We're living in a time and age when, even between two informed and responsible adults, legally speaking every partial step of a bedroom encounter would require explicit consent from both partners. Implied or unspoken consent is not a thing in any place that has yes means yes laws. Yet strangely enough, nobody seems to consider the fact that the child potentially resulting from such a consensual encounter can never be asked for their consent even once. While this baby scene is the one that all the fuss is about, it doesn't actually have anything to do with the main characters. It's just a clip the mad director shows to the protagonist, which is his last wake-up call to realize what he has gotten himself into and the thing that gets him to try to bail. But the drink he's having while watching is already spiked with the drugs and so it goes. Milos hasn't done anything wrong yet at that point, but once he's drugged, the plot still finds a way to also make the protagonist violate the consent of both his wife and his own son. And he does so accidentally, not just because of the drugs, but also because their bodies are covered up while they're only half conscious. So here we have a guy who started out just wanting to provide for his family and get them out of financial dire straits, and instead ends up doing the most harm to those he loves the most. And he could probably even be considered incapable of guilt for the entire time period, given that he was not only drugged, but forcibly drugged on top of that. Is that a reference to determinism, or perhaps even its common strawman fatalism? Either way, the movie manages to pull this off in such a way that you can still empathize with Milos at the end, despite all the things he has done, especially when you watch him realizing what he has done without having had any control over it. At this point, the trauma of the events of the past three days naturally becomes too overwhelming for the family, and as a consequence, the only way out that they still see for themselves is to decide to self-terminate. And they do so in the most calm and peaceful way that is reasonably possible for them at this point. They all lie down in bed together, and Milos points his gun in such a way that a single shot is sufficient to take them all out at once. But wait, we're not done yet. After all, the premise of the movie is that it doesn't even stop after you're dead, so obviously there is still one thing missing in order to complete the overly literal depiction of this premise. With the three of them already being nicely positioned in bed, once another film crew shows up at the house, 
well, I think you can put two and two together at this point and imagine where this is going. Fortunately, at least one thing does indeed stop right there, and that is the movie itself. Aside from the more frequently cited main premise, though, I've also heard yet another major interpretation of the core message of the film. That the life and suffering of you as an individual can matter less than other people's carnal desires. And at this point I'm totally expecting the vegans in the comments to hijack the conversation, but feel free to do so. So the philosophical victory at the end, even though it's obviously a pyrrhic one, is still a big middle finger to those carnal desires of others. The last act of defiance in not just saying, but proving, that your own and your loved one's well-being, even if that has been reduced entirely to avoidance of suffering, matters more than other people's carnal desires, even if it comes at the cost of your own life. Well-being, as an inherent value, trumps any potential inherent value of life itself. In a weird way, that's a strangely optimistic ending. And the reason I believe it might be intentional is that there is a brief moment just before they all go to bed to off themselves, in which the camera zooms in on his wife ever so slightly smiling. This would be a complete disruption of the movie's tone otherwise, but this way it might indeed be intended as one fine silver lining to all the dark clouds. Sure, the closing credits scene does its best to dispel any potential optimism when another adult film crew shows up to the scene of the tragedy, and the director tells one of his actors to start with the little one. And I guess at that point most people will think the director is just trolling. Can you one-up family self-termination? Of course you can. But while the film might need this seemingly redundant addition of insult to injury at the very end to deliver the last part of its primary premise, that it doesn't even stop after you're dead, if you interpret the movie in line of its second premise, then the three dead bodies lying there at the end really couldn't care less. Whatever happens to them now, they can no longer suffer from it. So any one of the customers of those movies, who apparently get their entertainment from watching the suffering of others, has indeed already lost at this point. And even the guy who's commanded to, well, send his rocket to their gas giants, at this point is still subject to the suffering of his own lust and desires. They are not. No longer. If you are wondering now what type of sick mind comes up with a movie like that, buckle up because guess what, reality always finds a way to one-up even the darkest human imaginations. If you already think that the words porn and newborn are the last two things that should ever go in the same sentence, how about replacing newborn with preborn? That's right folks, meet the fig wasp. In this species, the males mate with the females before those females even hatch. So the females are essentially born pregnant. Then the males tunnel out of the fig and allow themselves to get eaten by the ants that are already waiting outside. They do so in order to allow the females to escape by distracting and feeding the ants with their own bodies, because obviously at this point they're disposable. See, that's basically male existence in a nutshell, impregnate and then die. The already impregnated females then climb out of the fig, find a new one, lay their eggs into it, then the females also die, new males hatch and the cycle starts over again. And if you think such real world behavior having been found in insects would never translate to real life humans, look no further than the case of the singer of the band Lost Prophets. Boy do I miss the times when I only associated that term with the Nissan Skyline from Need for Speed Underground. People like to shoot the messenger and blame a movie like a Serbian film for supposedly having invented depravity, rather than just drawing attention to things that actually happen in the real world, however rare they might be. Because if they did the latter, they'd have to acknowledge that the often assumed flaw for the worst thing that can happen doesn't really exist. I remember Terence Pop describing PTSD as coming to this realization. Your natural filter of potential scenarios blocking out certain things that you consider unthinkable gets removed. Now everything is possible, all the terrible things you can imagine and all the things you can't. I don't know if he has ever connected the two, but I certainly do know that he has seen a Serbian film, because he referenced it at least twice in his videos. I wanted to end this video on this most controversial film of all, because I think it outlines the contrast in the clearest possible way. Anybody holding life as an axiomatic value, and is thus looking for metaphorical truths in terms of what benefits life, would probably consider a former Yugoslav motion picture the epitome of a movie that's metaphorically wrong. Not just because of all the wrong things that happen over the course of the film, but also because of its ending, essentially celebrating the family's self-termination as a victory, however small. But if you look at it through the lens of well-being as the highest value, then the family's decision to leave at the end feels completely organic and like the only natural and logical consequence. If you've gone through what they have gone through, there is simply no coming back from this. Sure, the movie could have depicted them going through countless hours of therapy or something, but how much could that really have accomplished at this point? The damage could still not have been undone. Preserving their own lives beyond this point would inevitably have led them to continue to experience more suffering than good.
For a preacher of life, such an ending will just reflect nihilism because it trashes the value he holds in highest regard, life itself. And nihilism, as I've pointed out in the past, may be literally true, but it's almost always metaphorically false, because you can't live like nothing matters. Suffering matters, meanwhile, is the opposite of nihilism. It states that there is something that, when in doubt, matters even more than life itself. Don't get me wrong, there are lots of so-called exploitation films and just generally disturbing movies that are nihilistic, that depict pointless suffering without offering any solution only being able to point to the existence of the problem itself. For example, I would place the remake of the classic I Spit on Your Grave in this category, with the protagonist getting her revenge on her tormentors, but continuing to break her own spirit as she's going about it. She doesn't win anything from it, she just turns herself into a monster. This felt way more like a Pyrrhic victory to me than Milos and his family self-terminating at the end of a Serbian film. Irreversible is another one that just depicts tragedy without solution, although that movie has been theorized by another YouTuber to in fact potentially contain some antinatalist messaging. Most horror movies, however, obviously aren't concerned with that. Their primary purpose is to shock, not to inspire. And thus, a lot of these exploitation films are indeed nihilistic and therefore I'd say metaphorically false. But a Serbian film, like it or not, is not one of them. At least not when you consider defining metaphorical truth in terms of that which serves well-being rather than just life itself. Then this movie will be there for you to show you just how low the floor for well-being can really get. And that if you just happen to be unlucky enough to ever discover where that floor is, Holding on to life and continuing to preach it as an inherent value becomes the truly cynical thing to do. So there you have it. The hundred kept posing the question, survival at what cost, until it eventually arrived at proposing either antinatalism or transhumanism as the only possible permanent solutions to human suffering resulting from that struggle for survival. Orphan Black and The Hunger Games both at least considered the idea of whether there are cases when it's definitely not appropriate to bring a child into existence, even if, in case of Helena, it would require sacrificing your own life in order to prevent that from occurring. The Truman Show demonstrated the necessity to overcome our biggest fear in order to be able to defeat God and escape from the prison of a fake and only seemingly safe world. Even Yu-Gi-Oh! still managed to sneak some of the misanthropic arguments against the survival of the human species into a show that normally only consists of repeating diatribes about friendship, somehow impacting the outcome of scripted children's card games. Avengers Infinity War and Endgame strawmanned the crap out of effortism and negative utilitarianism, but still deserve credit for at least giving its general logic considerable exposure to a massive audience. Aniara, True Detective and Attack on Titan all seem to be much less apologetic about inserting antinatalist viewpoints into their plot structure and dialogues, often not even trying to hide them in plain sight or disguise them in metaphors, just flat out stating these thoughts out loud. And finally, while a Serbian film is obviously just as blunt and explicit in conveying its ideas, at least it doesn't flat out tell you what to think about it. It just trolls you and happily accepts literally any reaction from you. But when the premise of a movie is, you're effed from birth and it doesn't even stop after you're dead, and you then espouse writing rule number one that authors should show, not tell, well then honestly, what did you expect you would get?